Joseph Lindsley is a traveler and writer and American reporting for Chicago's WGN Radio from Ukraine each and every weekday of Russia's full-scale war. He is, I believe, the only journalist on the ground who is reporting with this regularity right from the start. He was once protege to Fox News founder Roger Ailes, but Lindsley escaped that frenzied world where power mattered more than truth. He came to Lviv, in Ukraine uh, for a Ukrainian Catholic University journalism conference on information overload, AI and responsibility and stayed. Joseph, welcome to the channel. Jonathan, great to speak with you uh, and, and, uh, and I feel very somber in many ways today, but also hopeful. I'm talking to you from the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv, which before the full scale invasion was the second biggest city in this country. Uh, I love this place. And I come here very often. And uh, today I, I arrived in the morning train from Kiev and the train le left at about 6 a.m. So I didn't have time to check the news about what had happened. I was running late for the train. Uh, but when uh, when the train arrived here in Kharkiv, I had cell service and I began to read the news and see that this city that the Russians had sent uh, a f several flocks of their Iranian suicide drones to the city uh, in one of their double tap attacks which means, you know, they, they attack and then they wait till rescue workers show up and then they attack in that moment. And so several firefighters lost their lives. And uh, as I'm reading that news, I'm getting settled in my place here in Kharkiv and there was no power. Currently, I have no power. Uh, I'm, I, I travel with a ridiculous supply of, uh, you know, like in Corona times, people carried like boxes of masks. Now I carry helmet, bulletproof vest and uh, tons of uh, power banks uh, to keep going here. Uh but as I was getting settled in my uh, flat here in Kharkiv, uh, I, we, the air raid alarm went off. And one of the channels I follow uh, in, in Russian language uh, for Kharkiv citizens said, uh, you know, said, hey, everyone be cautious. Uh, lately, the Russians have been sending a new type of missile. It's really hard to detect. Uh, at any point, something could happen and you, we might not have any warning at all. And as I'm reading this message, you, you hear that awful, hideous sound the thud of a rocket uh, hitting the city. It seems that it hit uh, what was uh, a, a, a long time uh, nuclear research facility uh, going back to the Soviet days is what they seem to have hit today. Uh, and so here we are in this city that, you know, for, for the past several weeks, when I was here even several weeks ago, they, there's been frequent power outages, uh, uh, it, you know, many, many attacks. Uh, even yesterday we heard that the drones, it seems, I was talking with people here all day today. Uh, usually you can always hear these drones, and that's why Ukrainians call them mopeds, or it sounds like a lawnmower, you could say. You hear it, and that's it's very sinister, but at least you can hear it coming. You have time to kind of maneuver, maybe, uh, unlike with a missile. But what I heard from people last night, they would hear the drones, and then they'd hear silence. And then they'd hear the drone again, which means that this, they have some sort of new ability to, to glide for a while uh, to help them uh, hide from Ukrainian air defense. Uh, also, suppositions that they have some kind of new coating uh, that that prevents radar from picking them up. So we are seeing. I mean, you know, Russia has always been trying to do everything they can to destroy Ukraine, and if you give them time, they find new ways to do it. So that's felt very keenly here in the city. But despite that, uh, you know, it, it's a uh, this afternoon. It's a beautiful sunny day. Uh, cafes are still open on generators. Uh, there's places that are boarded up because of mis previous missile attacks, uh, their windows are boarded. And you often, the words you see uh, on those boarded up windows are often, uh, we are working, we're still working, you know, come on in. Uh, so the, and the parks are filled, there are people here. Uh, so, th so that's why I travel here, Jonathan, because, you know, when, when the world is sort of forgetting about these places, this show, this is the capital of courage. It shows the possibility of victory. And Anthony Blinken the other day in Kiev, I'm sorry, in Paris, uh, you know, he said, Kiev will not fall. It's impossible. Well, I want people to ask, well, why do you only talk about Kiev? Why do you not talk about Kharkiv? Uh, why does this not matter to you? And that's the reason why I'm here, uh, to share the stories of these people in this city. And of course, the idea uh, must be implicit there. And this is where Russian propaganda gets through, that Kharkiv is a predominantly Russian speaking city. And somehow, uh, you know, is worthless or shouldn't be fought for or 
if it falls to Russia, then maybe that's not the worst thing. There seems to be almost an implied judgment there, which is very much what Russian propaganda wants us to think. But you're painting a different picture of people, whether they speak Russian, whether they speak Ukrainian, it's immaterial. They're Ukrainian. They want to be part of Ukraine and they are staying. They're staying to defend their city, their businesses and their lives. Yeah, and this is, it's, you know, a narrative and is the best science of the particular to actually, you know, get beyond the data and look at the people in the place. Um, and, but we, if we see, you know, we have these false narratives, for example, over the weekend, uh, Elon Musk tweeted uh, his, you know, latest opinion on Ukraine formed without ever coming here to visit. And he said, uh, you know, uh, the West of Ukraine will not fall. He said the resistance there is too strong. Uh, you know, people will always resist. Uh, there's no way that, that Lviv and such places will fall into Russian hands. But he says, unfortunately, in the East, uh, you know, the, the, the East is going to fall all the way up to the, you know, the left bank of the Dnieper River. And that's the river that divides Kiev uh, in two. And this is patently ridiculous. In fact, you know, if you were here in Kharkiv City for just a couple of hours, you know, he doesn't even have to come here. He could send some emissary from his team for just a few hours. Before you ride off an entire people, you can take a train, you can safely, and have a nice coffee in the train, a nice meal. It's very pleasant. <laughs> take a train, come here, and see the reality before you write these people off. Uh, but actually, this is sort of the capital of resistance. Because in Lviv, I mean, you know, it's, it's you know, the war still touches people in every possible way, and there's a lot of wounded people there. And, uh, you know, that you can't plan for your future. Uh, and but, you know, in the Lv Lviv, it's life is, is I mean, we have some Americans visiting right now to volunteer and they said, I'd rather be in Lviv than in Los Angeles or New York or many other places. It is such a pleasant place. Um, and uh, but but there's not, you know, I mean, there are sometimes attacks there, but it's not intense like it is here. And and so the people here in Kharkiv, they are like the vanguard of the resistance. They are like the supreme resistors uh, because they have to do it every day and because they go through these missile and drone strikes. So for, for Elon to, to, you know, it shows a complete misunderstanding of it, but it's not just Elon Musk uh, that, that, that said, you know, he says it more explicitly, uh, but this is the de facto policy of the White House. They don't care about this city. And I think, as we said before, I mean, I was talking, there was a reporter from Washington who said she was getting her fancy coffee here. Uh, in Kharkiv and uh, and said, it's just too bad these people don't realize the city's going to fall into Russian hands, but you don't see any sign of that. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, a Russian politician said uh, uh, that, uh, you know, we need to, we're going to, we're going to bomb, uh, you know, the hell out of Kharkiv uh, until the people get in their cars and leave. And this is a change because now we're starting to see that, you know, I mean, these are these war, you know, these are Russian speaking people, but I mean, more and more, they're doing their best to speak Ukrainian because they're so sick of anything like any affection they might have had for any kind of Russian language or culture. After you get bombed enough, you say enough of that. And uh, uh, and so that's really changed. But but, you know, everyone here grew up speaking Russian. And until 2022, they were speaking that. And and Russia's first, you know, rhetorical, you know, sort of public rhetoric was, uh, oh, we're going to liberate these people. And now how they're explicitly saying we're going to bomb until they leave because we know that they won't, you know, they know that they can't invade the city because everyone, will, you know, they have Molotov cocktails and they're onto the teeth. And they've tried in 2014 to do it. They tried in 2022. Uh, so now it really seems their strategy is to delete the city. Uh, and unfortunately, in the West, uh, you know, the leaders don't even they, they they write off the city and they do it even by just simply not talking about it. Uh, that's why I come here to report from here uh, because I, w when the full scale invasion started. I had already been to Kharkiv uh, in January of 2022, and I heard so many stories about how people resisted in 2014 with much less resources. And I said, Kharkiv for me was like the, the the indicator that Ukraine was not going to lose. Uh, and and so this is why I'm here to 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 try to push back against you know the the narratives that smother the reality and the truth. And there is so much truth out there about what Russia does to uh, populations that it controls, to cities that it takes over. People just have to see that extraordinary, powerful piece of work, 20 Days in Mariupol. And as, as I've done, you know, speak to people who, who who actually made it out of that city, who who used to call that city home. And you realize that, that, that it's it's quite 
the opposite from liberation. It is an extermination is what would happen under Russian um, control. Uh, and of course, the propagandists, you say, are absolutely explicit about that now. They say destroy all utilities. And to an extent, if you listen to their genocidal rhetoric, they would not trust any Ukrainians who remain in the city, even ones that would choose to remain as a small minority may choose, um, you know, be, be sort of uh, indifferent as to who controls them. Uh, but most would flee. Um, but we know, we know how Russia behaves now. Uh, so this is this a, a blatant, willful um, ignoring of the facts? Because if you were to embrace the facts as a decision maker in Washington or, or Berlin, for instance, um, you would have to take action. You'd have to mobilize your people, mobilize your economy. Um, therefore, it's easier to, to, to bury that truth and pretend it's not there. Well, first I'll say when we we talk about who controls, it, and, and this is where I think it gets lost in a lot of the um, the conversations about Ukraine in the West. Like Russia is a, a society is, is a society where the government controls. It's about control. Uh, Ukraine, uh, the people control, and and so it's not about Ukraine, uh, some kind of government or you know the administration of President Zelensky controlling. It's not that. It's the people. Uh, who control? They're they're very independent. I mean, it, you know, I was talking yesterday with some Ukrainian soldiers and just just talking about life here, and you know how the 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 police, you know, uh, are very respectful of the people. They almost bow before the people because they know that the, the authority is the people. Uh, this is an inversion of so much of what we see around the West, and certainly what we see in Russia. Uh, so control is. Uh, it, Russia is about control. Ukraine is about freedom, and and, and that's 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 that, that's the essence that we see here every day. Um, but I think this, uh, you know, you you really, you really feel, especially being in a place like this, and when these attacks happen, as I was here a few weeks ago during some terrible attacks, um, and you listen to the rhetoric from from the Kremlin, Russia's goal is this maniacal, it's sick and it's maniacal, is to is to destroy. Uh, destroy these people that have built these lovely cities, uh, and 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 wipe them off the face of the earth. And I think a lot of it is jealousy, um, uh, hatred for people that can make something good that is out of their orbit. And uh, and it, 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 it's it, it, it's sick. I mean, it's what we saw, you know, with, with the Nazis and Hitler. And I think, but a, a key thing, like we look at that twenty days in Mariupol, and and actually it was a Kharkiv guy that was the director of that. Um, and it's a very powerful and very important film that that's documented. But I think right now, as we're looking, if you know, if you want to reach the Americans, um, more stories of tragedy does not really help. Uh, the people who already were going to care about that care. Uh, uh, but for, but for many people, it's just it's the same old. And I think the more, more tragic stories you see, the more it seems like, oh, geez, this is impossible. Why don't you know? And this is what we hear, the kind of the rhetoric we hear, the, the sort of Kissinger style rhetoric, even though, you know, may rest in peace, but, uh, you know, of, of Jake Sullivan and others, uh, you know, cool your jets and your freedom a little bit. Why why can't you just, you know, put up with some, you know, being under Putin, you know, and, and all this, this is really the mentality. Uh, and I think that's another reason why I like to be here in Kharkiv, because Kharkiv is not Mariupol right now. It's not Bakhmut. The Russians want to do this and to try and piece by piece, but it's a huge city. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's it was Ukraine's second biggest city, one of the you know bigger cities in Europe with an advanced subway system uh, and uh, safer and cleaner than New York's, by the way. And uh, and and it, it, a massive infrastructure, a, a city of universities, uh, and it's uh, it, it it even now in this time you see a city that's a great place to be. And I think I, I want Americans to see that. We I made this video. Uh, with the members of our team called Midnight in Kharkiv. Have you ever seen, you know, uh, Woody Allen's Midnight in Paris? Uh, that the opening sequence with the music of Sidney Bechet, uh, and you just see the scenes of Paris for four minutes in the rain and in the sunshine. And so we made a video like this about Kharkiv. But instead of rain and sunshine, it's beautiful moments of peace and Russian attack. And, uh, and it's, you, but you see, even now, the rebuilding is happening even in this time. And um, uh, I think as probably I've told you before, but, you know, I, I, I'm here, you know, I was here in January, uh, say there was a cafe that was destroyed. I come back in March, that cafe is rebuilt, even though it could be destroyed tomorrow. 
Uh, and so this and I, this this gets totally lost in all of the rhetoric uh, and fancy talk from Washington. I mean, the past few days we've had uh, uh, Secretary Pritzker, uh, United States Secretary of Commerce, uh, was in Ukraine and, and talking about rebuilding. Now he's talking about rebuilding, and they always said, "Well, what are we going to do? You know, after victory?" But <laughs> just missing the very important thing: how do we get there? Why not just send the weapons? And the rebuilding talk bothers me because. The rebuilding is happening. If you if you're in Lviv, you first hey, what kind of rebuilding needs to happen there? They rebuild. They've already rebuilt things that were destroyed last summer. Uh, in Kiev, there's you know, there, there's always building happening. Uh, Bucha, Irpin are really lovely places again. They've been restored uh, two years after the massacres that happened there. Uh, there will have to be rebuilding in occupied places, but you know, first we got to free those places. And uh, and in Kharkiv, even businesses are reopening. And so when they talk about rebuilding, you know, it bothers me for, for two reasons. One, because it plays into the American sort of the Mike Johnson, American conservatives who oppose Ukraine. They're like, oh, look, we see BlackRock and all these globalist people moving into Ukraine uh, to take advantage. And you know what? There's actually a lot of truth to that. You know, they're, they're waiting for the right moment because they, they, this country has amazing, vast resources. Uh, and 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 minerals and, and, and farmland and everything, uh, and they are indeed trying to take advantage. And and yet they'll, they'll happily talk about that. But the, the the people that talk about investing in Ukraine and rebuilding, most of them will will, will say not, not a peep about sending long range weapons, air defense. This city right now, I mean, any moment I could have a missile in my face uh, or glass in my face because uh, there's no air defense here to protect the city. There's there's no desire to protect this and. I think Jonathan about like the the drone attack that happened here last night, uh, where uh, in the in the double tap attack, uh, several firefighters were killed. Uh, there was a, a young firefighter. He went there. He happened to get there at the same time as his father, who was a uh, also a first responder. His fifty two year old father and his father was killed in, when the next wave came. And there's a video of this young guy, young firefighter, just crying, sobbing. And uh, police and other officials are are hugging him and just trying to calm him down. It's just an absolute disgusting hell. And this is from the drones that are Iran Iranian designed. Now, seemingly, a lot of them are made in Russia. And a few days ago, Ukraine had an incredible success by sending Ukrainian made drones 1,200 kilometers deep into Russian territory to hit, among other things, a drone production facility. And what what does Washington say the next day in Paris? Anthony Blinken uh, uh, in, in Paris said, uh, you know, that we don't, we, Washington does not endorse this. Uh, and so much so, it was an astounding scene because the French foreign minister was at a press conference right next to Blinken. And he, he disagreed uh, publicly uh, with, with the U.S. Secretary of State. And uh, the, he said, uh, our policy is not really to make a comment, uh, but Ukraine uh, has the ability to defend itself against an aggressor. Uh, it's better to make no comment than to say, we don't endorse Ukraine, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, attacking things on Russian soil. But how can you say that if you like when, when I mean, what are we supposed to do? What, what exactly is supposed to be done? We just we just do we just sit here and die in Kharkiv? Do we leave Kharkiv? What does Washington want? It's an extraordinary turn, because if you translate that into historical examples, it, you know, rather than seeming sensible, if you put a layer of sort of, you know, realist uh, international relations guff over the top of it, if you actually translate that into historic examples, it would be like saying to Britain, well, you can defend your territory, but don't hit Nazi Germany, you know? don't touch Berlin, not allowed to do that. Or after 9-11, you know, um, yeah, by all <laughs> means, protect your territory, but don't go after anybody else. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up because that is the perfect thing. And, you know, the fact is uh, so much of our defense establishment on the left and the right, you know, totally endorsed that, including uh, Biden when he was uh, a senator. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, we lost uh, a lot of people and, and, and prominent American landmarks on 9-11. And what, what do we do for the next 20 years? Um, <laughs> we hit places very far away, not in our territory. And Ukraine can't what they can't even have precise. By the way, these are effective attacks. Uh, and, and you know, and if you can't ever even congratulate Ukraine on this, you know how how can you possibly win the narratives? And this is why I mean, it, you know, the 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 White House is whatever you know. We I I wouldn't call it cowardice, but I you know the White House's failure to 
allow Ukraine, you know, even to have no comment on this, but to say allow Ukraine to push uh, for victory in a real way to protect places like Kharkiv gives cover to the Republicans who want to, you know, cower and hide from this. You know, they're all sort of complicit in this. Uh, but if you look at um, the uh, the BBC headline uh, on Monday, after, after Ukraine, um, you know, had this very successful drone attack, 1,200 kilometers into the Russian Federation. I don't know if you saw this, Jonathan, but the BBC's headline was this. Deepest Ukraine drone attack into Russian territory injures 12. And, you know, if you're, if you're someone sitting in your kitchen in California or you're driving to work somewhere in Austin, Texas, and you hear this, you're like, oh, this just needs to stop. Why are the Ukrainians killing and injuring? And it totally misses the point. Like, like that facility that they hit has killed thousands, thousands. And even um, uh, one of the stories, some of the stories say in, in, in uh, Western media that the uh, students were injured. That's what the Russians were saying, the students were injured. Well, uh, it seems as you look a bit deeper that it was uh, engineering students building drones that are killing Ukrainians. So, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, students of, 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 you know, okay, but they're, they're making things that kill people uh, in their homes uh, every night in Ukraine. So, and this is how, even when Ukraine does something extraordinary, it's like they, they, they don't get the positive story about it. And so, and then it looks, it looks like Ukraine is losing and everyone just says, let's give up on it. When really we have so many great stories to report. I mean, as difficult as it is here in Kharkiv, uh, it's a reminder, you know, Kharkiv is hit because it's so close to Russia. Uh, Kiev is very well protected, uh, and the Russians have realized that they can't so easily and uh, successfully attack deeper within Ukraine. So now they're just trying to to pound places like this. But um, for all the horrible things that's been that have been happening really since since 2024 began, um, the you know Ukrainians are having some great successes, especially in the Black Sea. I mean, it's dangerous for a Russian ship to be in the Black Sea for more than a few hours, uh, if that. Uh, and this is an extraordinary story, doing... isn't it? I mean, that Black Sea is a remarkable story because at the time uh, there were also rumours that the US wasn't particularly happy about the Black Sea uh, fleet being targeted uh, and indeed air bases and other facilities on Crimea. There's a certain amount of disquiet. So public, they were saying, yes, you know, you can hit uh, places within your sovereign territory. But we we got the sense they weren't particularly uh, thrilled by it. And, uh, they, you know, you go into this... Um, thought process of escalation management of fears of escalation and so on what we saw in reality is russia can do nothing about it and as soon as ukraine started to do that and repel russia from the black sea its trade exports went up and up and up and returned to their previous level which is a critical strategy for earning money to keep ukraine in the fight and resilient so what's disturbing about this, and it's been many months ago that I first sort of started to float the idea that, you know, the uh, incrementalism, the incremental supply of munitions is not just accidental or due to bureaucratic inertia and whatever, that there's a genuine strategy there to try and balance the battlefield, to make sure Russia doesn't lose too badly, doesn't gain too much, an extremely misguided, and one could even say immoral and cynical strategy, now, it's no longer in the subtext. It's blatantly and openly omitted by the US. And one presumes that Berlin is quite possibly aligned with this strategy. France, however, uh, as you mentioned in your comment just now, seems to be breaking away from that. Uh, to use the uh, colloquial phrase, uh, Macron seems to have grown a pair. And there's been a fundamental change in attitude. Yeah, well, you know, first, I think, you know, we have to, I mean, it's impossible to know what is, you know, on people's hearts, but we look at their actions. Um, and, 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 you know, in a way, I mean, it's, you know, there was a conspiracy theory among diehard supporters of President Biden for a while that he secretly was trying to do more. And maybe he himself wants to, but his administration is not. Uh, but that's a conspiracy theory. And, 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 uh, and actually, we see in practice, you know, it's two years. I mean, do we need 20 years to prove it? Uh, I know we like 20 year war. But uh, it's very clear, especially uh, with, with Blinken's comments about drones, uh, about hitting the drone facility. And then if you look at the Black Sea story, it is something that is, is not talked about much. Uh, and, it, you know, if, if, 
if we when Ukraine had that deal that the United Nations Turkey brokered deal that you know for the, basically the first year of the full scale invasion that you know so benevolently allowed the grain to be exported to the Black Sea, uh, they're now exporting more grain than they were when they had that deal, uh, significantly more uh, in a shorter space of time. Uh, it's been less than a year since it expired. And because when that deal expired, then they were able to actually fight. They, but when the deal was there, it totally benefited Russia. The Ukrainians weren't allowed to hit anything in the Black Sea. The grain was, you know, a small amount was allowed to be exported. But meanwhile, the Russians could use their assets in the Black Sea to pummel Ukrainian cities, which they did. Um, and But when that, uh, including all uh, uh, last winter, the pre preceding winter, uh, 2022 to 2023. And so, but once that deal expired, we saw things change because Ukrainians could punch back. And we see that this is precisely an example of why you can't, you're, you're not better off negotiating. The only thing you can do is to, to defeat the, uh, you know, someone uh, as evil and vile, uh, you know, as, as, as Russia here. And so since, when well, what we had though, last fall, Ukrainians opened up, they pried open a window. I mean, there were, there were very few missile attacks. Kharkiv last fall, uh, you know, was, I mean, you, it was, it was almost becoming like Lviv. You had sporadic attacks, but it was, it was very pleasant and, and very safe. The Russians, uh, uh, their abilities were, were significantly weakened. They had to uh, divert a lot of resources to moving basically their entire Black Sea fleet uh, away from Crimea and to, uh, to mainland uh, uh, Russia and out now to occupied parts of Georgia. Uh, and so Ukraine had a window. And this during this window, no, bare, you know, Washington sent 17 attack ins and that was it. And there was no talk about it. Uh, and then, uh, so every time Ukrainians open a window, uh, the, 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 we, 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 miss, we miss that opportunity. And I think this is what President Macron, uh, just I guess over a month ago now, you know, he said so clearly. Um, I mean, it, that speech was incredible. It gave people around Ukraine, people were saying, Viva la France. It gave them encouragement. Um, and he said, we need to stop speaking in a vocabulary of limits. He said, two years ago, we said no tanks to Ukraine. Well, because we're afraid of Russian red lines. Well, then we sent tanks. And okay, did, what did Russia do? <laughs> Russia, Russia you know, is struggled, and and Ukraine got more success. Two years ago, Macron said we sent medium range. Uh, we said we would never send medium range weapons to Ukraine, and then we did. And then what? Did, did, did the whole world die in nuclear winter? No. Uh, and, and actually, you know, when those high Mars first arrived in 2022. Uh, a Ukrainian city was falling into Russian hands every week. And that stopped because of the high marks. We, we can actually look at the good thing. Whenever America does send these weapons, we see results. Um, and, 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 and so Macron very clearly said this. And then he powerfully said he, he, to the French people, we don't have to be afraid, he said. And then also to, to, the, to Putin and to Russia, he was saying, we're not, you know, you're not the only nuclear power. He said, we are a nuclear power. We have a doctrine. We are ready, and it was very. It was a. It was. It was a. It was a change, and it was a character development from who he was uh, in the beginning of this. And the Russians did. Uh, the, the Russians were, were disturbed, and actually, I mean, on Russian social media, they were. They were just. You could tell they were upset about this because it was so powerful, and yet it barely was in the American headlines. Uh, and and for many for a couple of reasons, one, the Russians pounded Odessa the next day with one of these double tap attacks uh, that hit rescue workers too. And then and and here's where we, this I think this I know this is extremely revealing about what who's on what side and how the Russians are infiltrating uh, and influencing us in America. And I say this by the way as someone who doesn't really think that Russia actually controlled the 2016 election. I think they gave us uh, the perception. That they had the power to do that, uh, and that was the real power. That's what they're they're very good at is making us scared of them. But that that same week when President Macron gave this like the most powerful speech of his life, it was in the format of an interview, uh, and 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 said, you know, we're not we're not like that in Home Alone. Where I'm not afraid anymore, uh, and no more talking about limits. We're talking about we have red lines, not you, to Russia. Uh, Candace Owens, American commentator, popular commentator. Uh, she had a video that so curiously was released that week uh, about Macron's wife. This bizarre analysis. She went to detailed analysis saying that Macron is, uh, that Brigitte Macron is a man. It was like 30 minute analysis, 20 million views, like in the first few days. And no one asked the question, like, and it was, this was trending on X. 
for about Brigitte Macron. And why did Candace Owens, um, why that week? Why not Why not six months ago? Why not two weeks ago? It was, it, it was too uncanny. Um, and, and, and it precisely smothered over everything about uh, Macron's speech. Uh, precisely, Jonathan. And this is, the Russians are very adept at, at steering uh, at steering our narratives. And they've done this, uh, like the, um, when we had the, uh, oh, the power, power just came back. Let there be light. <laughs> we, we, I have, we have, we have power. We have power once again. Um, but the, I go back to in uh, that one week in January where Russians just, I'm sorry. No. Yeah. Where Ukrainians destroyed uh, three of Russia's 24 most powerful planes that sort of helped to coordinate also, that's air alarm. Oh, sorry. I think I lost my video for a second because uh, I'll lost. explain. I don't know if you can hear, can you hear the noise. Yes, is that the, the air raid app uh, so, firing off? Well, so here's the situation at Kharkiv. Because there's limited power, the air alarms that are like the physical ones often don't have power. So they can't uh, they can't sound. And so what happens, and I'm trying to fix my uh, phone here. One second. Uh, so... They, as an emergency backup, you have this horrible, annoying uh, beep. Uh, but this is a little slice of real, real, real life here. Um, uh, but, but, you know, I mean, that's something that people don't realize that even the air raid alarms can't sound when there's no electricity. Um, and so Ukrainians just quickly find some some new solution. Um, and I, while we talk, I should, I need to check. This is the routine that you do to check and see why the alarm is sounding and you know you can kind of then figure out how serious is this and now we're told uh this is due to, to uh there's a, a russian migs are in the air which means uh that you know these are capable of carrying in the hypersonic kinzhal missiles um and i would imagine let me check whenever they're in the air there's alerts throughout the entire nation uh, of ukraine uh which reminds me of, <laughs> like maybe a few days ago Time and space are very difficult to, to manage here sometimes in the war. Uh, a few days ago, I was in the Carpathian Mountains in, in Western Ukraine uh, I just, for one day and night. I just needed some rest with no missile attacks. I had been so often here in Kharkiv. I was on a beautiful river bank. It was the River Opir, which means resistance. Because for a thousand years, Ukrainians have been sort of protecting Europe from Mongol and Russian hordes at that very point. And uh, it was a lovely, lovely day. And I, I have a good rest with the fresh mountain air. And at 6 a.m., Vibek, explosions. In my little idyllic Carpathian retreat, I could hear the explosions because the Russians were using uh, drones and they've been using hypersonic missiles even to hit uh, this little city uh, outside of Lviv called Stri. And it seems that they're looking for uh, gas depots. I mean, as they try to hit the power, uh, energy grid here. They want to cut off potential for from energy to come in from Europe, and they're also looking to hit military depots. So, so there I was in my idyllic mountain break, and even there, uh, you know, you, you you feel the war. But uh, but anyway, there's no mo. And at this moment, there's no indication of anything incoming. But so that the last week in January, Ukraine shot down three of Russia's most tw powerful, uh, twenty four of the most powerful, three of the twenty four most powerful attack coordinating planes. That could have been an extraordinary headline. That is, I mean, that that's an, yet another boost for the little guy. You know, at least now and then, how about a nice headline when you do something good? You know, uh, everyone gets a participation trophy. Ukraine does great things, and they they can't get a good headline. And what was the headline that week? What was it? What was the narrative? It was all about R Russia audaciously said, um, "Oh, one of those planes has sixty-five Ukrainian POWs," and they just said this. And we, we, now it's months later. There's no follow-up. No one talks about it. There's no investigation. And I, I was on uh, some interview, uh, one of my interv you know, regular interviews I do. And this is a micro level of just how powerful the Russians are controlling narrative. You know, I'm going live uh, and, you know, it's a short segment. And I'm asked the question, Joe, what do you think of this? Uh, 60, Ukraine shot down 65 of its own prisoners of war on the, in the Russian plane. And for a few seconds, I got sucked into it. I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I'm talking about Geneva Convention, that the prisoners, you know, they should never have been on there. Russia was violating Geneva Convention. And then I realized that even though I'm criticizing Russia, I'm doing exactly what Russia wants because I'm deflecting. I'm making, you, you know, Ukraine looks sad and hopeless and weak. 
uh, but I'm ignoring, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Extraordinary success, uh, two A-50s and one IL-76, uh, two spy planes and one sort of transport plane were destroyed by Ukrainians. Uh, these three powerful Russian planes significantly weakening, once again, Russia's uh, uh, air force. And, and we have still not a shred of evidence of this POW uh, a story. And so I, I immediately sort of, I realized that and I brought myself back to it. But you, you see how even someone like me who's paying attention to this can easily get sucked into uh, the, the Russian uh, narrative control in the most absurd ways. And yeah, I mean, we won't even comment on on BBC headlines because, again, there seems to be a pattern of I- I- incompetent headline writers. Uh, the one you mentioned, I've seen that numerous times applied to numerous different occasions. Um, and of course, if we're trapped in our partisan political bubble, uh, and and, and for, for for much of this two years, you know, we've been. Um, not perhaps sort of querying the motives um, and strategy behind uh, Biden's uh, administration. Now, as we approach a potential Trump victory, of course, there's a certain amount of hysteria about that. But I think what Macron's change in stance suggests is something far more concerning. And that this, this isn't, you know, just a threat from the MAGA GOP, right? That actually we have a systemic dysfunction within the US system, and that actually Europe needs to wake up. Uh, NATO has started to take moves to almost plan for uh, a future without the US actively participating. Um, we need to wake up strategically and realize that the US is not going to come and, and, and save uh, save Europe. It is going to be distracted by its own traumas, potentially. Yeah, and I think here's where we see, you know, I think one reason why in the political elite in Washington, we see there is, you know, such uh, uh, a hatred uh, of Trump is because he says what they actually uh, allowed them actually believe, and they would never say in public. Uh, there was a video of this with Trump and Pelosi and Schumer were negotiating in the Oval Office, and Trump was just talking with them. And they were, you know, there's a bit of a like playground screaming match, screaming match, and uh, and uh, I think Schumer said, "Let's talk about this after with no cameras." Um, because that no one wants to, that to be revealed. Uh, and so I, I, I think that, so, you know, it's, you know, Trump will say what he thinks, uh, you know, whatever about all this stuff. And, uh, but a lot of people actually de facto are the same. And it's like, we can criticize Elon Musk for wanting to give up on Eastern Ukraine. Well, that's, you know, in different words, that's pretty much what secretary Blinken is saying by only talking about Kiev. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it's sickening. Um, and, uh, let's, you know, if we go back, there's a pattern of this on, you know, uh, you know, we've seen this in history before in the UK in the 1930s as well. But, you know, go back to uh, George H.W. Bush, 1991, uh, his Chicken Kiev speech telling Ukrainians, keep your cute little freedom in check. You don't really stay with Mother Russia. Uh, this is what the CIA guy, former director of the CIA says. I don't think Ronald Reagan ever would have said that. Uh, but George H.W. Bush gave, gave that speech. And then Clinton, uh, which he Clinton, to his credit, apologized for this, uh, you know, pushing Ukraine to give up its nuclear weapons. And then in 2000, uh, 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 early 2000s, uh, then Senator Barack Obama, Democrat, and then Sen- uh, the late Senator, I think late, uh, Richard Lugar, Republican, bipartisan effort to get Ukraine, not only the nukes were gone, to give up its best weapons <laughs> uh, in the early 2000s. And then in 2014, with the revolution of dignity, uh, when when Ukrainians would do something that everyone who's like in MAGA movements or RFK movements, uh, Robert Kennedy uh, Jr., all you know, all this, all these people who and, and Black Lives Matter, anyone who feels frustrated with the system, sh- should could look to that revolution of dignity and see a blueprint on how you could achieve how people can control society, because you know the people of Hong Kong, by the way, they were in a dire, dire straits uh, more than many people protesting. And they looked to Ukraine as an example. And when that happened uh, in 2014, uh, you had the American officials, you know, trying, you know, the, the, the narrative is that the Americans were creating this. They were trying to mitigate it. They were trying to find a way to manage it. Um, and, and you had then Prime Minister of uh, Poland, who's now once again Prime Minister of Poland, Donald Tusk. He, he told the protesters, he said, and I think this is very revealing into probably the mindset in the White House now. He said, you need to do, 
negotiate. You know, we're gonna, you know, you, you've done a good job protesting for months. Uh, you resisted the bullets to the secret police, but you need to negotiate now. You can get some good concessions. We'll have elections, you know, sometime in the magical future. Uh, but if you don't negotiate, you're all going to die. And and the protesters said, no, sorry. Uh, and the, by the protesters, I mean the people, the people of this country, of all different ages in the squares of their cities. Uh, and this is like going back to like the Viking uh, thing, you know, the ancient uh, parliaments on the hill. Uh, the leaders of the protesters came to the square, the Maidan, and they said, here's what the Europeans tell us to do. And the people said no. Uh, and within a few days, uh, the, the regime, the pro-Putin regime fled. Now, there was some kind of truth to Tusk wards. In that moment, the people won. But we see now. I mean, it's because of that that we face billions of dollars worth of missiles and drones every week. And so there is a truth to that. But it, it, it comes down to people who believe, who, who want to manage things and think that, that keep, you know, keep it some kind of some semblance of peace is much more important than some idea of being free. These are people who like to control, to, to manage things. And uh, this is their mentality and who they are. And I think uh, they, they, lack, they lack an imagination or ability to, mm. to, to believe in, in, in victory. I, I, I think to believe that, but it's, to, to believe that people can be free uh, and free, you know, uh, this is a hard thing for us as Americans to, and you know, it's even as I, as an American, you know, in order to be free, look at everything our founding fathers, you know, all the theories and going back to Aristotle, like you, you have to have some strong culture, some bonds that help you cooperate and work with each other. Um, I see that here. Uh, and that's why Ukrainians are able to be free. But, you know, in America, it's hard for us to see that possibility. And so I, I think that this is part of the reason why uh, our leaders don't care so much about freedom. Um, I don't know, John. I mean, what do you do? You have do you have. Yeah. A pinpoint analysis of why? I think, it, I think you know, I, I did float this idea to someone that actually uh, Ukrainian style of freedom, because it's worked, one of the few examples in history of, of it actually working, because it's not just a mob rule, that there's actual, there's method there, there's techniques, there's techniques which are uh, copyable. You know, if you, you you can try to reproduce that effect, it's exceedingly threatening. So no one I've spoken to, would, would would sign up to the idea that actually you know America and others are not so hot on uh, Ukrainian freedom because it threatens their own privilege and status. But I think there's a certain lack of recognition because freedom, I think as it's as it's come to be in our sort of fat consumerist societies that have not had to face these difficult life and death decisions for many decades, freedom is very much associated with privilege and status. And let's face it, you know, the, uh, someone like Jake Sullivan is a classic example of privilege, status, assumptions, and almost like, a, um, you know, a God-given right to to, to rule, etc. Um, whereas what Ukrainians are doing here is saying that actually freedom is about participation. Freedom is about expending your energy and your imagination and taking risks. It's not about power being consolidated in the hands of oligarchs, corporations, and so on. It's it's a very threatening idea, but I think we've come to associate freedom with things that actually are are antithetical to Ukrainian freedom. Uh, and actually, this is why I think you know, if we're going to be completely selfish about it, we need to help Ukraine survive because actually we need to learn. We need to relearn uh, and reinvigorate our own systems and move them away from the idea of privilege and status being synonymous with freedom because that's sclerotic. That is um, the death knell, I think, of of our societies. Well, and this is this is precisely the storyline that I think the so many the people who feel sort of dispossessed and like that they have no agency in America and I, and I understand why I mean they, they feel disconnected you know life is quite difficult I and mean, that's why every American I know who comes to Ukraine is so happy here even like I was in a bomb shelter today with Americans who had just arrived and they're seeing Ukrainians they know and the, the building's shaking and everyone's hugging each other and smiling uh, but the, they've built such a lovely uh, country and society and and I, Americans are, are tired and they feel disconnected from the process of politics. Uh, I mean, we have lots of corruption in America and, uh, you know, corporations write our laws and all this. And we feel 
how you know the you 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 to, so to those people i think if they could understand that you know what think about why is russia spending so much money and time and resources to destroy this country and the answer is precisely because ukrainians have figured out how they did for you know they have still it's still you know they still have it but especially 2014 to 2022 they figured out how to after centuries of struggle how to enshrine their freedom wild freedom freedom of the people at the you know like uh subsidiarity right the people you know, faith, family, freedom, how to protect that, how to flourish uh, in that environment, how not to be controlled by elites, how not to have corporations controlling what you eat. You know, think of the Americans, I forget some cereal company saying, oh, we know it's tough in America, eat cereal for dinner, you know, just poison your, yourself. And like, I know Americans are waking up to this and they're sick of it. Ukrainians are one of the last examples in the world, or maybe the fiercest example of people that hold on to their ancient traditions while also innovating. And they do this in this real spirit of freedom, um, uh, so so much so that you know even the the police bow before the people. I mean, the, the, the people really rule here, and this is such a threat, uh, not only to Moscow, but to powerful people in Berlin, uh, uh, in Paris, uh, and and in Washington, I mean, all over the world. I mean, this is they they don't want the revolution. Apart, you know, it's if you could get more Americans in particular, and I focus on that because that's, I mean, like the UK is doing really a, a, ton, you know, a, a lot by sending storm shadow missiles, which Ukrainians are continuing to use with great effect in Crimean Peninsula. But America, you know, it hold, they hold the keys to turning this around so much more quickly. And, but this could really reawaken America. And this is the narrative that the powerful elite do not want Americans to know. And the Russian propagandists do not want the Americans to know uh, and you know a, a great example of it is Hong Kong. I mean, and Hong Kong makes me sad every time I think about it. But in 2019, in particular, the the people they they saw that China was trying to 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 strangle them finally, and and sometimes there was like one seventh of the population of that city, the extraordinary numbers out protesting when they still had the ability to do so, and they were waving Hong Kong flag, British flag, and. The Ukrainian flag, because they, in their dire situation, knew that Ukrainians had figured out how to create some protective mechanism around your freedom. And it's not about governments. It's about the people. It's about the Maidan, the public square. Uh, in Hong Kong, that law, it, it failed. And when the coronavirus arrived and the Chinese were able to, 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 to stop it, um, the Beijing, Beijing was able to stop it, the, the government. And, but so if, if people in such, a dire, in such dire straits could respect Ukraine, you know, why, why can't Americans see this? And if they did, maybe it would begin to open up the possibility. And I've asked so many people here, you know, how, I mean, what is the magic? You know, what, what, what enabled Ukrainians to find this freedom and to, you know, to be willing to, to, to face the threats of, you know, missiles and drones and bullets and, uh, you know, I mean, every day. I mean, I was talking to people today who were at a funeral of a, uh, yet another soldier fallen in battle. And, you know, it starts with something very much. Micro. And there was a right before the uh, revolution of dignity, like 2012, 2013, uh, you know, people were trying to make their lives better after the hell of the century of Sovietism. And in these um, Soviet era apartment buildings uh, in, that are in many cities in Ukraine, uh, everything was controlled by like some central authority. And so no one took care of common spaces. It was all controlled by the central authority. And a movement began for people to, to control their buildings. But in order to do that, they actually had to participate. They have to go to monthly meetings together and say, OK, how do we manage our, our park, our uh, playground, our common space, our stairwells? And they began to, to work together and they forged ties with each other and their neighbors. And so many people I speak to say that the revolution of dignity worked because of that. That was the turning point And that was what created... Uh, by, and then it spread out to neighborhoods and it wasn't just in the Soviet buildings, but that was what created the, this horizontal strengthening of ties among the citizens that when, 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 when the, you know, the pro-Putin regime began to shoot the people, they were ready and prepared because uh, so, you can't just have a revolution overnight. You have to build a strong society. And that's what that, so that's really the key. And this is what Ukraine could show, could show to Americans. But this is what Russia 
is trying to erase because it's such a threat to the people who love to control. And we, we, we know these people. Read Shakespeare, read Macbeth, read you know, Shakespeare. This is a part of you know humanity. And uh, and I think when folks like Blinken and Jake Sullivan and the White House and and uh, and Berlin and other places, they too, they never they don't want to admit it, they are also threatened by this radical idea of freedom. And that's why they don't run to to support it. And and that's what Javier yeah. Mille does. But yeah, so yeah, no, absolutely. And I think what also is not understood because of course it's a very managerial point of view isn't it that you can somehow negotiate with tyranny that somehow you can balance a war that you can manage risk somehow you can control a, a situation uh, and normalize it i mean this is a very managerial response is to normalize everything that goes on even if you're living in absolutely extraordinary times we see this happening over and over again in the media you know, the amount of absolutely bonkers things that Trump said and some of the things he did, um, you know, off the scale. Um, and yet almost immediate attempt to normalize what's happening. Similarly, you know, normalization of an absolutely outrageous policy that's now admitted by uh, Blinken um, to conduct a war. No war has ever been won in history in the fashion that they are, uh, you know, claiming Ukraine should behave. And I, based on what you've said, Ukraine won't behave. But the last idea here to finish on is freedom. Freedom is indivisible and it's incompatible with tyranny. So those who are thinking that somehow we can accommodate Putin, that somehow he'll agree to be contained and to allow our values to sit side by side with his, um, that is, I think, deeply illusory. And even if Ukraine comes to a sort of standstill or a forced negotiation or whatever, I, I know Ukrainians won't accept that, that won't stop the aggression. That won't stop the force of tyranny trying to erode and destroy our values. And if they can't do it externally, they will do it internally. And as we know, as you said earlier, Russia is extremely good at that kind of weaponized lying and narrative spinning. Yeah, and agree. I, and uh, Jonathan, I, I should make clear that I, I, from everyone I know in Washington, and my experience there, I, 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 you know, I equate what the White House's actions, like you could, like Trump's mouth and the White House's actions are the same right now. Actually, it's the same. And, and if we can realize this, and we have a way out of it, we can start to say, get more people to wake up and say, wait. Because the yeah, it's just very clear point. So yeah, Trump's act, Trump's blah blah blah, and the White House actions are actually it's a beautiful Trumpian golden marriage. It's, it's a uh, systemic uh, problem uh, now. Yeah, it's not a partisan yeah, we've seen problem in Washington. now. Yeah, exactly. And uh, but on this, uh, you know, look at just in the past couple of weeks, um, the uh, I mean, the for the first time since World War II, as far as I can tell, uh, air raid alarms sounded in the country of Moldova. Uh, several times in the past few weeks, Poland has scrambled F-16s. Russia is getting, you know, sloppier and lazy, uh, you know, in a, in a way. Just, they don't care anymore uh, because they see that they can push and push and push. And and Ukrainians will resist, but they're trying to hide that from the world. And they see that the West, um, you know, th doesn't doesn't really react. And so you have missiles flying over Moldova, Romania, and Poland now, uh, at least briefly. And uh, we can easily see how this, this can spill out. Uh, into those countries, so that's why I do think we see some Europeans waking up. But yet, yet they they still, you know, they miss. It's a simple, it's a simple thing. Just send weapons to Ukraine. It's it. The Ukrainians are they're they're not asking for soldiers. They're saying send us tools. Um, and and yet these countries are are stocking up and getting everything they need. I mean, 2023 was the best year ever for sales of American defense products because you're getting the world scared and they're buying stuff. Oh, and what is the uh, this absurd thing that um, uh, Argentina, uh, the the, the Argent so United States last fall gave F-16s to Argentina, and Denmark Denmark is giving some F F F-16s maybe I mean everyone promises this but <laughs> two years we we never see it to Ukraine but they're giving more F-16s to Argentina. What are, are we preparing? Is Argentina is it preparing to take the Falklands? But I don't know. I mean, what, are they threatened by Brazil? What, what 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 is going on? Why are they willing to? And and this is the same when people talk about rebuilding. They have these fancy conferences in London. They want to do everything, then talk about the clear and present danger because it's scary and it's messy and it's difficult. Um, 
and uh and 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 yet and yet when you're here in Ukraine you see that yeah it's difficult but it's possible to win um it's you know and 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 you you learned so much I, I was talking with a a friend in Donbas uh, we were on a mission delivering these drone jammers uh a few weeks ago and I'm do that I'll do that again soon in Donbas and we came up with this idea of how war can fix your brain you know because you, you can't live in fantasy land you have to say hey these people want to destroy us uh, if we live under them, it's, we have no freedom. So we have to find ways to fight back. And uh, the more people can be, hopefully, like Macron, we'll see in the, if there's you know actions. I mean, it's promising signs from Paris, especially the way that the foreign minister uh, criticized Blinken to his face. Um, if we can see more of that, uh, we could, you know, we, we uh, every time we can plot it. Every time Ukrainians are given great tools, they. Um, very swiftly use them to great effect. Uh, it's very simple. We can see the evidence of it. So why not send more? And after every one of these sort of infusions of support for Ukraine, we do not, we see a weakening of Russia. So we can use that to find some strength and courage. And that's, uh, that's, that's what I keep trying to share to the world. And Jonathan, that's why I, you know, I, I think about it every time when I'm on that train coming east here to Kharkiv, sometimes I wake up on the train, I'm like, what am I doing, man? I'm, I'm going going right to the edge, uh, but that's because this is the place that shows the possibility of victory and uh, and of courage and inspiration. It's the place where the solution resides and the will, the will to protect what you value. We didn't even get on to Havana syndrome, but again, to your point there, <laughs> the reaction of a, of a of a Trump White House maybe not so different from Biden. One would claim it's a full story. On the other hand, it's completely ignored barely covered at all and yet the implications if true are stunning it's essentially uh proof that russia has declared war on the west many years ago and has been conducting offensive uh, operations against state department officials in in the cold war that would have been a trigger for extraordinary escalation uh, now people are afraid of taking action afraid of defending freedom afraid of defining what that freedom is and what diminishes it and what increases it, even, even having that discussion, uh, which is so natural, I think, to have with Ukrainians is a difficult discussion to have with with others who aren't in Ukraine. So uh, I think we have to make America feel good again. We got to we got to believe in who we are. And, but we, that starts in our as Ukrainians did it starts in your communities and you have to build up nice society. People are doing this and trying it. And this is. The movement I see of people trying to eat better food and not corporate stuff, and that's like, and if someone could find a way to bring these things together, uh, we could find a way to believe in ourselves again. And by the way, that I see that every day here. The you in Ukraine, you have Americans from the left and the right who come here and they work together in a way that we don't see in America because they have common mission and purpose, and they see the things that transcend that. It's really this is a way to fix it. How 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 Ukraine's resistance can fix your brain, I think, is the key. And, uh, maybe in the future we can talk about how a few years ago I was living in Philadelphia and uh, Russian agents came after me. So I, I've known that was in 2015 or so. Uh, and uh, I uh, the FBI informed me, but I already had a good suspicion of it. And I was just I was just I formerly worked at Fox, but I you know, it wasn't anyone particularly influential. And, uh, and they were coming after me. So they've been uh, for a long time. Russians have been trying to to uh, I mean, here's what they've done. I mean, they. They were inviting uh, many groups of Americans every year for about 15 years uh, from the early 2000s on free junkets to Moscow and St. Petersburg. And they invite top uh, you know, journalists and entrepreneurs and politicians. And uh, I was warned about this. I, I didn't go. Uh, and um, but just imagine the cameras that they had in the hotel rooms. And, and when, you, when you look at people who were few, this is this is the other the dirtiest part of it. It's not just about principles and ideas, but look at the people who are opposing support for Ukraine and just see, you know, th th maybe there's some dirt on them. Moscow has been very, very and as we look at the Savannah syndrome story, um, Moscow has been very adept uh, at these types of attacks and controlling people. Uh, they, they have a lot of power as a result, and, and they, they've taken representation away from the American people. Uh, so that's important. So that's, it's, it's a mafia behavior, isn't it? You know, either you coerce, and if people refuse to be coerced, then you hurt them. And this is, it's a very simple equation. It's a mafia mindset. 
Yeah, indeed. And uh, by the way, uh, I think the last important thing to, to mention uh, as we fight against this mafia mindset, you know, I look at uh, Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, and his district in northwest Louisiana is very evangelical. And if those people in his district knew what Russians do to evangelicals, to any Christian um, in occupied territories, they they would probably turn into the Cajun Navy and get over here. They would, they would, not only would they start voting to, to demanding support for Ukrainians, but they'd probably want to come and help. Um, uh, there is no freedom of religion uh, in Russia unless you're part of the state religion. And this is what I can't figure out. Americans who hate statism, allegedly, or are not, you know, they don't realize Ukrainians are fighting against statism better than anyone. And if Ukrainians lose that, then that fight is lost for maybe a century. Uh, uh, it, it is because, because Ukrainians are the example of how you can resist, uh, including uh, um, uh, these the evangelical Christians, especially in, in, Z- in occupied Zaporizhia and her soul. And then the stories of what the Russians have done there are absolutely atrocious and, and turning uh, evangelical churches into, into Russian cultural centers. That, you know, with pictures of Stalin and Putin. Uh, if you see the, the reality here, uh, I think once, if, if people simply knew that, I think they would, their minds would change quite quickly. It's incredibly important to get the message across. And that makes what you're doing incredibly uh, important at this time, hopefully reaching out to people who will listen and change their points of view and take action to get in touch with their congressman and so on. Um, Joe, it's been brilliant talking to you, as it always is. Uh, I know everyone on the channel wishes you to stay safe and uh, look after yourself, especially given the position Kharkiv is in. And uh, we appreciate uh, your uh, broadcasting daily from the pointy end. Jonathan, thank you so much. Uh, you can catch that if you go to ukrainianfreedomnews.com. You can see our YouTube channel where I post my daily broadcast on Chicago's WGN Radio every single weekday for two years. And uh, my T-shirt today, it gets from... Uh, Friends in Lviv says malo po malo, which means uh, little by little, step by step. Uh, that's the only way to uh, to fight against tyranny. You just every day, keep going. So, thank you, Jonathan.